بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين أما بعد فقال سبحانه وتعالى يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون وعن أبي هريرة رضي عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الصيام جنة رواه إمام البخاري رحمه الله تعالى we begin as always, first and foremost, praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our Lord, our Creator, our Sustainer, and sending salutations upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And then secondly, I would like to thank the Masjid for once again inviting me to the Masjid to deliver a reminder. Yeah, first and foremost, a reminder for myself. لا يشكر الله من لا يشكر الناس. The one who is not thankful to the people has not been thankful to Allah subhanahu wa taala. Now, last Ramadan, yeah, because some of you may be wondering why are we talking about Ramadan and preparation for Ramadan three months before Ramadan? Yeah, it generally it doesn't happen. Now last Ramadan, I was delivering a series of speeches, series of lectures in another masjid. And I would always say that for Ramadan, we should make a preparation. And it just so happens this year, I am asked in advance, three months in advance, can you give us some advice on how to actually prepare for Ramadan? Now when it comes to the dunya, for example, everyone makes a preparation. Yeah, so, those of you who are into sport, yeah, for example, boxing, MMA, whatever it may be, yeah, you stay up all night to watch that fight. Yeah? I know the Muslim community, they like Khabib. Yeah? And they stay up all night to watch his fight. And that fight, it will last about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, something like this. But to get to that stage, to get to that stage, he had to prepare. It wasn't a 20 minute preparation. It wasn't a 30 minute preparation. Rather, it was days, it was nights, it was weeks, it was months. <coughs> a whole lifetime of dedication to get to where he is. Or get to where they are. Similar, we see every four years, we have the Olympics. Now myself, previously, i talking a long time ago, maybe over a decade now. Yeah, I actually studied to become a personal trainer. Yeah? And I qualified as a personal trainer. And we would study how Olympic athletes prepare for the Olympics. Yeah, so... They've just had the Olympics. They've got four more years now until the next Olympics, but they are already in preparation. They would have cycles of preparation. Why? So that when it comes time for the main event, for the main event, they are at their peak. And this is how the attitude of the Muslim should be. In the year, the main event is the month of Ramadan. The month of Ramadan. And all of us, we actually do prepare for things in our life. We, as youngsters, we have elementary studies. Yeah, we go through the education system. We have to wake up early. We have to go through all of these hardships. Five days a week. Eight hours a day. And then we go on to secondary education. And then what starts to happen is, you get to the age of about 14, 15, and then now your teachers are telling you, this is where... Your skills are. This is where your strengths are. And here are where your weaknesses are. And this is what you need to improve. If you want to achieve this grade, this is what you need to do. And then we go on to college, similar. Then we go on to university, similar. Why do we do all of this preparation? We do it so when it comes for the t crunch time, I get that job. I get that job. 25 years preparation to get that job. Why? Because that job is important to me. And again, the month of Ramadan, 
being that one month in the year which is the most important month to me. And we see from the Salaf that many of them would make dua that for Allah to make the month of Ramadan blessed for them. And there are narrations which mention that prior to the month of Ramadan, six months in advance, they would make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that month to be beneficial to them. And then they would also, after this, some narrations mention five, some mention six. Those that say six, they say it includes the month of Ramadan itself. They would ask for acceptance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because they understood the importance of the month of Ramadan. And if you look at the Sahaba radin anhum, they actually had, when it came to worship, today we're talking about fasting. Next month we will talk about prayer, and the following month we will talk about Qur'an. Why these three? Because Ramadan, these are the, these are the pillars. Yeah, we're all going to be fasting in the month of Ramadan. We're all going to be doing our prayers, and then on top of that, we're going to be doing the optional and extra night prayers. And we know the month of Ramadan being the month in which the Qur'an was revealed, so we're all going to be increasing in our recitation of the Qur'an. And if we understand how to get the most out of these three, we're going to have a very beneficial Ramadan. And we're going to achieve the aim and the target of Ramadan, which is, who can tell me? What is the purpose of Ramadan? We hear this every single year in the month of Ramadan. Every single Jumu'ah, four Jumu'ah sometimes, five Jumu'ah sometimes, in the month of Ramadan, we are, to- we are told the purpose of Ramadan. What is the purpose of Ramadan? Taqwa. taqwa. Yeah, to attain Taqwa. What does Taqwa mean? Closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, khair. If you look at the lives of the Sahaba radin anhum, how much zeal they had for worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to become people of taqwa. They had so much zeal that there was one Sahaba, for example, his wife had to complain to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa saying, my husband fasts too much. My husband prays too much. He is neglecting my rights. The hadith of Anas bin Malik, radil anhu in Sahih al-Bukhari, he mentions that a group of three came to the house of the Prophet sallallahu and they asked the wives of the Prophet sallallahu about his worship, about the worship of the Prophet sallallahu And then it goes on to mention that it was as though they thought to themselves, this, this is, we can do more than this. Yeah, it, it's, it doesn't seem so much. So one of them, and there may be people like this, they, he said, I am going to stand the whole night in prayer, I'm not going to go to sleep. Yeah, there may be someone like this amongst us. One of them, he said, I'm going to continuously fast, I'm not going to break the fast. Again, there may be people like this. One of them, he said, I'm never going to get married. Yeah, there's no one like that here. Yeah? And when the Prophet ﷺ returned and he was informed of this, what did he say? What did he say? We, we think, wow, this person's so pious. Amazing. How can he be doing so much worship? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Ana asum. I also fast and I also break the fast. And there are narrations where the Prophet ﷺ had to prohibit. He had to prohibit the Sahaba radin anhum from doing continuous fasting, which is known as Somul Wisal, the continuous fasting. So the Sahaba radin anhum, they had this zeal. And we see how they were prepared in their general life. We see how people of the past were prepared. We see how, we think to ourselves, you know, this is the Sahaba. We can't be like that. Yeah? In the times of Jahiliyyah, the hadith of Aisha radin anha, again in Sahih al-Bukhari, the Quraysh, the Mushrikun, 
they also used to fast on the day of Ashura. The day of Ashura, they used to also fast. Why? Because at that time, they believed they were on the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam, even though they were doing shirk. Yeah, so they used to do things like Umrah. They used to also fast. You may be thinking, that's a different time. Yeah, it may have been common back then. A few years ago, youngsters who used to attend this masjid, and some of them still attend this masjid. I remember they said to me, this was 40 days before Ramadan. 40 days before Ramadan, these were youngsters who were involved in drugs. Yeah, they used to take drugs. What did they say? They, 40 days before Ramadan. They said, we're not going to touch any intoxicants. Why? Because we are want our Ramadan to be accepted. This is the person who was taking drugs. Even he, even that person <coughs> wanted to prepare for Ramadan and wanted his Ramadan to be accepted because he understood the importance of the month of Ramadan. You know, it's very unfortunate many a time we see someone doing some wrong and we look down at them. All of us make mistakes. And yeah, I remember in one masjid where I was delivering lessons, on one occasion, a brother who attended, he was actually addicted to drugs. He was so addicted to drugs that prior to walking into the masjid, at the door of the masjid, he was smoking. Yeah, he was smoking drugs. And he came in. He came in, he sat for the whole lesson. But again, as soon as he stepped out, again he is smoking drugs. Why? He had an addiction. He didn't want to be in that state. He told me himself. He doesn't want to be in that state. People like this, they need our help. Yeah? We don't need to look down at them. We don't need to push them away. Rather, we want to bring them to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So why? So that I can also gain the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, we understand why it is important to prepare for the month of Ramadan. And we see the purpose as is mentioned in the verse which I said at the beginning, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Fasting has been prescribed for you, like the previous nations, why? So that you may, you may become people of taqwa. Yeah, and, like the brother said, the translation you can say, some, book, some translations you will see, it means fear. Yeah, the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does anyone know the definition of taqwa? Again, most likely we hear this year in, year out, every Ramadan. So if we don't know what taqwa actually means, how are we going to attain it? Yeah? The kid goes to school, he doesn't know what GCSEs are. How is he going to attain the grades? He needs to know what he... Yeah, so same when it comes to taqwa, we need to understand what taqwa is. The scholars, they give a very comprehensive definition and that is to do that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded, and to refrain from that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited. Yeah? And I call this a dictionary definition. I call this a dictionary definition. Because we're still thinking, what does that actually mean? If I say to you, an apple, it is a circular fruit. Okay. But, have I understood the texture of the apple? Have I felt the crunch of the apple? Have I felt the juices come into my mouth? No. It's a dictionary definition. So now we have to understand what are the sifat? What are the qualities of taqwa? And I'll mention a few. And we're going to talk about this in more detail when we're talking about the Qur'an. Because in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the people of taqwa over and over and over again. One of the qualities of the people of taqwa is muraqabah. Yeah? The consciousness and the awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all times. Yeah? And another quality is, like he mentioned, the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? The fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What do we mean by fear? Yeah? What do we mean by fear? Because Allah he is a rahman He's a rahim He's al karim He's al ghafur we know this about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Most definitely, most definitely we fear the punishments of the hereafter. We fear the fire of Jahannam. 
we fear all the punishments that will take place in Jahannam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from this. We fear the punishment of the grave. We fear all of this, the iqab. However, those of you who are parents, you will understand this. And those of you who are grandparents, you may have forgot now, because grandparents, they are much more softer with the grandchildren. Yeah? But a parent to his child, he's much more strict. A child does something wrong. He breaks something. He breaks a window. Now, the mother, the father, whoever it may be, very angry. And the child realizes, I'm in a lot of trouble. Yeah, so what does that child do? He starts to cry. Yeah, and the child, he cries and he clings on to his mother. His mother is telling him off. His mother is screaming at him, shouting at him. But he's clinging to his mother. Why? Why is he clinging to his mother? He's fearful. He's fearful of losing the rahmah of his mother. The mercy of his mother. And when we say the fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yes, fear the punishment. But we also fear losing the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, what has this got to do with fasting? Yeah, what about fasting is it that makes me become of the people of taqwa? How do I attain this muraqaba of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How do I become obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How do I become fearful? The definition which we just mentioned of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How does this work? One of the benefits we gain from fasting is Weakness. Yeah, weakness. What's this guy talking about? How is that a benefit? Me being weak. Yeah, again, going back to that person who is preparing. He has to go through all of the sufferings. He has to go through the hardships. He has to go through beatings. Why? Because at the end time, he will be strong. He will be victorious. A person, when he realizes his own weakness, and we're talking about the fasting person now, he realizes that I've gone a few hours without food. I've gone a few hours without drink. I'm in so much pain, I'm in so much suffering, I'm getting headaches, I'm getting cramps in, cramps in the stomach. I don't want to be in this situation. In the Akhirah. Because in the Akhirah, that situation will be much worse. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-A'raf. وَنَادَ أَصْحَابُ الْجَنَّةِ أَصْحَابَ الْجَنَّةِ وَنَادَ أَصْحَابُ الْنَارِ أَصْحَابَ الْجَنَّةِ The people of the hellfire, they will call out to the people of Jannah. أَنْ أَفِيدُ عَلَيْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ That pour over us some water. Pour over us some water. So they're not saying... Give me a glass of water. Pour over us some water. From the water you have, pour over us some. Sprinkle some water at me. Or from that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. Food. Other drinks. Because the people of the hellfire, and there are different punishments in the hellfire. Some of them will be suffering from hunger. And those who will be given food, who will be given drink, Again, they will be still be suffering from hunger. They will still be suffering from thirst. Why? Because the drinks of Jahannam will be boiling oil. Boiling oil. Now imagine a hot summer's day. Yeah? You've picked up a bottle of water, it's warm. It's not cold. How much of a dislike do you have for that water? How uncomfortable do you feel by that drink of water? So imagine that person in the hellfire who is drinking boiling oil. Another of the drinks that the people of the hellfire will have is pus. Pus. We think, what is he talking about? Pus. Can you imagine milk which is outdated by a few days? How much stench does it have? You bring it close to you, you feel like vomiting. So now imagine the pus of the hellfire. 
And you think to yourself that I would rather have this moment of hunger, I would rather have this moment of thirst in this dunya, worshipping my Lord, obeying my Lord, than being like those people in the hellfire, who are going through suffering for all eternity. And there will be so many different types of punishment in the hellfire. Another of the benefits of weakness is that it breaks the desires. As it comes in the hadith of Abu Huraira radiyan anhu in the sahih of Imam al-Bukhari, I mentioned at the beginning, very short part of it, that the fasting is a shield. Yeah, the fasting is a shield. Some scholars, they say this means a shield from the hellfire. And then it goes on to say that, يَتَرُكُوا تَعَامَهُ وَشَرَابَهُ وَشَحْوَاتَهُ مِنْ أَجْلِ This person, he leaves his food, he leaves his drink, he leaves his desires due to me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if a person, and remember when we're fasting, when we're fasting, when we're alone, even if we're in the kitchen, even if we're by the fridge, what do we do? We don't break our fast. Why? Because I'm conscious, I'm aware that my Lord is watching me. I'm aware that my Lord doesn't want this from me. So now imagine, if you're able to leave out your necessities, you're able to leave out your necessities, food, we all need food, we all need drink, you're able to leave out your necessities for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what about those things which I do not need? What about those things which do not benefit me? What about those things which actually cause me harm? Another of the benefits of the fasting is, and this is the answer which I used to always hear in school. Yeah, when non-Muslims would ask us, why are you fasting? Every student would give this answer. Oh, it's to feel how the poor people feel. This definitely, this is one of the benefits of fasting. That you're able to understand a small amount of what someone who goes through this on a regular basis. But what do we still have? We still have two meals a day, minimum. We still have our iftar, we still have our suhoor. You're able to understand their situation. And what happens when you understand that person's situation? You feel like assisting them. You feel like helping them. You feel like now giving charity. And we see that Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhuma, the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he mentions that, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم أَجْوَدَ النَّاسِ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was the most generous of the people. And the time in which he was the most generous of being generous was in the month of Ramadan. And we see this again amongst us all. That when in the month of Ramadan comes, what am I doing? Every day, there's an announcement, we have a collection. <coughs> Why? This is one of the best times to be giving charity. Another thing is, again, this is all to do with weakness. A person, he realizes that I myself, I cannot do anything. He realizes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is qadir. Yeah, because as insan, many a time we are blinded by our own foolishness. Yeah, my own intellect, I am a very smart person. My own strength, I am very strong. I go to work, I do this, I do that. I... No, who is the one who is actually sustaining me? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I go a few hours without some food. And how weak am I now? Yeah, and I've actually worked at places where staff members, they had to actually lay down, take some rest. Grown adults. Strong. On a normal day, they're strong, physical. But all of a sudden, without a bit of food, without a bit of drink, I become so weak. And you realize that I am reliant upon my Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then what do you do because of this? You realize that I cannot achieve anything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is in control of everything. What do I need to do? I need to beg that Lord. I need to beg my Lord because He is the one who can assist me. 
And we know that when it comes to uh, dua, when it comes to dua, there are certain times where dua is more likely to be accepted. Yeah? Certain times where dua is more likely to be accepted. For example, a dua between the iqamah and the iqamah Yeah, the dua between the uh, adhan and the iqama is not rejected. Yeah, hadith in uh, the sunan of Imam Nasa'i. But we also see, and this is one of the benefits of fasting. Yeah, because if you make the firm intention that tomorrow I'm going to fast, that also means you're making a firm intention to wake up for suhoor. Why? Because I don't want to be hungry all day. If you make a firm intention... Whether I wake up, whether I don't wake up, I'm fasting, regardless. Yeah, because suhoor is not compulsory. But you've made the intention, guaranteed more than 90%, you're going to get up. Why? Because you don't want to be hungry in the day. So now, we see the hadith, again in Sahih al-Bukhari, where it's mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends to the lowest heaven in the last third of the night. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked, Who is there to make dua to me? Who is there to ask from me? Who is there to seek my forgiveness? And I will answer them. I will give them what they want. I will forgive them. We always hear about Qiyamul Layl. You have any problems in your life. You're looking for a job. You're looking to get married. You want your children to get married. What to do? Do Qiyamul Layl. Tahajjud. And make dua at that time. <coughs> but then we see, I made the intention for tahajjud, I wasn't able to get up. Yeah, You'll get the reward. Next day again, I made the intention for tahajjud, I wasn't able to get up. Make the intention for a fast. Yeah, You will get up. You don't want to go hungry. And now that gives you the opportunity to be of those people when everyone is asleep. When no one knows what you're doing. To plead and beg your Lord. To plead and beg your Lord. And you think Allah won't give it at that time? This is the time of suhoor. And then there's a verse in the Quran. We were discussing this a few weeks ago. That in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَإِذَا سَأَلَ عِبَادِ عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ That when my slave asks about me, then no, I am close. أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِي إِذَا دَعَانِي I answer the dua of the one who calls out to me at the time of him making that dua. Does anyone know where this comes in context in Surah Al-Baqarah? Anyone? Okay, the verse of fasting. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامِ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ أَيَّامًا أَعْدُوا And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to explain some of the rulings relating to the fasting. Here, yeah, some of the rulings relating to the fasting. A few verses later, we have this verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, I answer the dua of the person who calls out to me. And then after this, it mentions, أُحِلَّتْ لَكُمْ لَيْلَةَ الصِّيَامِ رَفَثْ إِلَى النِّسَاءِ إِلَى نِسَائِكُمْ yeah? What is permissible for you in the night time with your wives and some other things relating to the night time? What does this mean? When does the night time start? When does the night start? From the time of Maghrib. Yeah? When the sun starts to go down. Yeah? So we have verses talking about the fasting. When does fasting take place? Night or day? Day. We fast in the day. You have a group of verses talking about the fasting which is in the day. Then you have a verse on dua being accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you have some verses explaining about the night. What time is this talking about? What comes between this time? At the end of the fast, before the night, what time is this talking about? Iftar. 
Yeah, before Maghrib. After the day, before the night, the time of breaking your fast. And you see again, what do you see? In the month of Ramadan, especially. At the time of Iftar, unless someone is waiting for his dates and his water is counting how many he has. Yeah, what do you see many people doing? They are making dua. You will see many people in concentration, in devotion. You will see people even crying. This is a time when your dua is going to be accepted. And these two times, the night time, before Subh Sadiq, yeah? And this time of iftar, or just prior to iftar, these are two times that if you're fasting, you're pretty much guaranteed you're going to get the time to make dua. Or you're going to force yourself to make dua at these times. Another of the benefits of fasting is, we're talking about muraqaba. Yeah, muraqaba. Again, in this hadith, the hadith of Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, he mentions that if someone fights you, oh shatima, yeah, oh he swears that he abuses you or something like this, then what are you meant to say? Inni sa'im. I am fasting. I am fasting. However, if it's outside the month of Ramadan, the scholars say, no, you can say it within yourself. Remind yourself. But what is this? Dhikr. Dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That I don't want my fast to be harmed in any way. I'm going through all of this hardship. I don't want to lose the reward. So now I'm going to remind myself that I am fasting. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching me. That I don't want to swear. I don't want to lie. I don't want to listen to music. And we see this. We see this in the month of Ramadan. But the question now comes is, do we see this outside of the month of Ramadan? This is what we all need to ask ourselves. That am I doing this outside of Ramadan in order, one thing is in order to gain all of these benefits, but another thing is to prepare for the fasting of Ramadan. Because what do we see every single year? Come the time of Ramadan, the first three, four, five days, everyone is complaining, lunchtime, I'm really, really hungry. Yeah, uh, at the end of the day, I've got a headache, I've got a migraine. Every year we hear this. Why? Because you're not accustomed to it. You've allowed your body to become accustomed to always having food. To always having drink. <coughs> Luxury. But if you take out one day, two days, a week, what will start to happen? Your body will start to understand that, hold on. It's similar like when you wake up. You wake up for work at a set time. One day randomly, you may have gone to a wedding. But the next day you still wake up at the same time. Why? Your body has become accustomed to that. So if you start to fast now, and we see the desire, the Sahaba and how they would want to fast. And they would fast so much. And we see the Prophet ﷺ advising some of the Sahaba anhum to fast, for example, Abu Huraira anhu to fast three days a month. Or the Monday and Thursday fasting. If we were to start this now, if we were to start this now, wouldn't we be prepared for the month of Ramadan? And this was called the inner secrets of fasting. But the reality is, it's not a secret. We know all of this. The only thing that we need to change is our mindset. Our mindset. My attitude towards this fasting. Is this going to be a adab for me? Is this going to be a punishment for me? Or is this going to be a means of me growing closer towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This is what we need to think. So, what are the outcomes? And these are just some of the benefits of fasting. Yeah, these are just some of the benefits. You have the book, if anyone wants to read more about more benefits, you have the book, the Maqasid al-Sawm, which in English is the purpose of fasting by Sheikh 
Abdus Salam, a Shafi'i scholar of the past. You can read more about this. But what should we take from this? I should start fasting now. Yeah? Whether it's the Monday and Thursday, whether it's the three days of the month which are known as the white days, the 13th, 14th and 15th of the Islamic calendar, or, or you know, I don't work on a Wednesday. My, my job is very hard, I do, a labor, I do a labor job. I don't work on a Wednesday. I, can't, I find it hard to fast on those days when I'm at work, I struggle. Fast on your day off. It doesn't have to only be these days. When it comes to your prayers, your nafal prayers, do you think to yourself, I only do my nawafil in Ramadan? No. When it comes to, again, teaching children, do we only teach them the, the fara'id? No, we teach them about the sulan, we teach them about the nawafil. Do as much as you can. But when it comes to fasting, do we teach? Do we do it ourselves? And the Sahaba radiyan anhum, they would actually make the children fast from a young age as well. And this is some advice because you now the youngsters, you see that when they see adults fasting, they actually want to fast themselves. Yeah? They really have a strong desire. And they're actually able to do it, many of them. We have a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he said, Muru sabiyakum bis salati idha balagha sab'a saneen. Command your children to pray when they are seven years old. And in the Musannaf of Abdul Razak, Abdul Razak, he mentions what does this mean. Yeah, so he brings the opinions of uh, Sahaba and the Tabi'un and scholars. And they say seven is an age where a child has starts to now have some sort of understanding. He's able to differentiate between his left and his right. His intellect is growing. Yeah, and we see this amongst children. That's why you see in school, key stage one, key stage two, yeah, which is about the age of seven. Key stage three, which is the age of about 10, 11. Ibn Abbas, he would say, wake them up, meaning for the Fajr prayer, even if they do, walaw bi sajda, even if they do one sajda. Why? You want that child to grow up worshipping his Lord. The purpose of our creation, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I didn't create man or jinn except for my worship. You want your child to grow up in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is there namaz fard at that time? Is it compulsory? Age 7? No. Yeah, it becomes compulsory maybe 7-8 years later for boys. Yeah? Age of 50, when? They mature. Some earlier, some later. Yeah? Latest 15. So, 8 years later. Is the prayer accepted with one sajda? No. Who does one sajda in the prayer? If someone did, everyone would be on, on their back. Brother, you've only done one sajda. What are you doing? But what are you doing? You're bringing them up in the worship and in the habit of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then it goes on to say that this is for the prayer, seven years old. And then what age do they start the fasting? Either ataqa, yeah, when they're physically able. So we see some children at a young age they're very strong. Yeah, where some kids they're very they're very weak. So you now have to decide: Is this child able? Does he have the desire? Does he want to do it? Can I create a desire in him? We have the example of. Ibrahim ibn Adham, rahimahullah ta'ala. A very big scholar of hadith, a very pious personality. He mentions that his father said to him, Ya Bunaya, O oh my beloved son, utlubul hadith, seek the knowledge of hadith, fakullama sami'ata hadithan wa hafidtahu falaka dirham. Every time you hear a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and memorize it, I will give you a dirham. I will give you a dirham. And he says, I learnt and I went and sought the knowledge of hadith because of this. Because I wanted these dirhams. Yeah? So now, those of us who are very strict, we think, no, the intention is wrong. Yeah, that child, he has to have the right intention. I'm not going to allow this. No. At that age, a child, he doesn't know. 
At that age they need encouragement. But who did he go on to become? He went on to become one of the biggest scholars of hadith. One of a, a very pious individual. Over time, his sincerity, it came. And this is another of the benefits of fasting, which is sincerity. Why? Because in the month of Ramadan, everyone knows the other person is fasting. Yeah? That's why you can say to the person, if they fight with you, I'm fasting. But outside of the month of Ramadan, you don't say this to the person. Why? Because you don't want them to know. You don't want them to know. Who knows? The time of the Hajjud. Who knows? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you're fasting and no one... Allah knows. Allah knows. And we have to... It's really... You know... I was very happy... When I saw messages going around... Saying... 100 days to Ramadan. I was very happy... And I was also surprised... When I was requested to do... This program. The... Our attitude towards Ramadan is changing. A few years ago, just a few years ago, four or five years ago, we didn't have things like this. No, many people, they weren't even thinking about Ramadan. 100 days left, 3 months left. Now we're hearing it on many people's tongues. But it's not just about talking, we also have to be the people who prepare for it, who actually do it, people of action, like they say. Here we have to be people of action. We're going to end it here. And these are only a few small benefits because time doesn't permit. If there are any questions, yeah, I'll take one or two questions. And I know there's sisters access today. So if there are any sisters whose husband or brother is downstairs, then they can send maybe a WhatsApp message or a text message or something. And then they can also ask a question. So I'll take one or two questions and then we'll end it here inshallah. If anyone has any questions. If you don't, then I'll ask you guys questions. Then you're going to be stuck again. <coughs> no questions. So how did you sum up taqwa? Taqwa, in a nutshell, so what I called a, a dictionary definition, taqwa <coughs> is to do that which Allah has commanded the five prayers, the fasting, hajj if you're able to, these type of things. And to refrain from what Allah has prohibited. But like I said, this is a dictionary definition. Yeah, if you want to really understand what taqwa means, pick up the Qur'an and you will see Allah mentions the people of taqwa and then He will mention their sifat. Allah mentions the people of Jannah and then Allah mentions their sifat, their qualities, their actions. Allah mentions the people of Jahannam and then Allah describes who these people were. So these people, when we mentioned earlier, that they will call out to the people of Jannah, you know, give us a little bit of water. They used to, it goes on to mention after this, in the verses after this, they were people who used to mock. They, used, they were people who used to mock the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then we read this and then we ask ourselves, which, which group am I in? Am I, do I have these qualities like the people of Taqwa? Do I have the qualities of the people of Jannah? Do Or do I have the qualities of the people of Jahannam, the Munafiqoon, and so on and so forth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who have the quality of the Muttaqoon and the people of Jannah. And the brother was about to ask a question. I was just uh, wondering uh, to elaborate about the, why is it the Mondays and the Thursdays? Mondays and Thursdays because there's many a hadith uh, which mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ would fast on these days. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, so, for example, uh, there, there's many, there's many uh, hadith uh, which mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ would fast on Mondays and Thursdays. And some masajid, what they actually do is on Mondays and Thursdays, you will have people come to the masjid. They will cook some food together and they will do the iftar together. But it doesn't have to be Monday or Thursday. <coughs> The sunnah. So the, uh, the, the fasting of what is known as the white days, yeah, the Prophet ﷺ used to do this, yeah, the 13th, 14th and 15th. So these are known as the, the sunnah fasting or 
the mustahab fasting, but to fast in general, you can do at any time. So we know the hajjud, for example. The Prophet ﷺ was regular in doing the tahajjud prayer. Does that mean I can't do uh, nafala any other time? Of course I can. 